We've been in a series called Summer Blockbusters, and uh, I've decided to title my Summer Blockbuster message this morning uh, about uh, the, uh, regarding the movie How to Tame Your Dragon. Two is out, actually. But How to Tame Your Dragon. I don't know if you've seen it, but it is a cool little show. It's a great show to take your kids to. But in the first movie, everybody was scared of dragons until this young boy learns how to tame his dragon. And uh, the dragon then, after he tames him, becomes his best friend. His dragon fights for him. He rescues him. He helps him save his family and his community. And of course, helps him find the love of a beautiful girl. Now that's a good thing to do. Well, I want you to know something. I want us to use this morning, in the analogy that we're going to use, of dragons as being symbolic of the choices that we make in life. Because it's so important for us to know, choices can be a blessing to your life, or choices can be a curse in your life. They're like the dragons. Uh, choices can change your outlook in an instant. Your choices can also ruin your life forever, it seems. If you want a better life, here's what you need to do. Learn how to tame the dragons of choice in your life. If you want to break bad habits, or if you want to stop addiction, learn to tame the dragons of choice in your life. If you want to be more patient, if you want to be more loving, if you want to be more kind, if you want to be more giving, learn to tame the dragons of choices in your life. If you want to be in control of your emotions, if you want to be no matter what the circumstances are, you're in total control of the situation, learn to tame the dragons of choice in your life. If you want a better husband, or if you want to be a better husband, if you want to be a better wife, learn to tame the dragon of choices in your life. If you want to be a better father, if you want to be a better mother, if you want to be financially fit, or physically fit, or debt free, or even wealthy, then you have to learn to tame the choice, the dragon of choices in your life. If you want to be healed of hurt emotions, or past mistakes, or be closer to God, or just want to be a happy person, Tame the dragon of choices in your life. Taming the dragon of choices can bring you happiness that you desire. Tame the faith. Let me tell you something. Faith doesn't work without you learning how to tame the dragon of choice in your life. Happiness is not possible. Love doesn't work until you learn how to tame the dragon of choices in your life. Nothing does. Even God can't help you if you don't learn to tame the dragon of choices in your life. But the good news is God can help empower you to make those right choices and help you tame those dragons. Nothing will go right in my life until I learn to tame the dragon of my choices. I'd like you to put those in your blanks on your note sheet. Just fill that in on your blanks. Nothing will go right in my life. Everybody say that with me. Nothing will go right in my life until I learn to tame the dragon of my choices. Good. The power of choice can change a person's destiny. I can actually choose to be happy. Did you know that? Or I can choose to be miserable. The thing is, I get to choose. Right. I get to choose. God gave me the power to tame the dragon of choice and the power to make those choices. Now you may be thinking, wait a minute, Pastor Jerry, you don't understand what you're talking about. You don't get it. We don't have a choice about everything. I realize that. You may be saying, haven't you heard about the economy? Yeah, I've heard about the economy. Haven't you heard about disease? Haven't you heard about disasters? Children's murdered in school. And those of you that know me know that I, I don't just hear about those things. I actually take off and go do something about those things when I see them happening. And I've been on in 63 countries around the world doing that myself because I want to go help people that are in those hurting situations. So I don't just hear about them. I actually go do something about them. But all of those things have no bearing on whether or not I'm going to be a positive, faith-filled, happy person instead of a negative, pessimistic, reactionary person. Because I have a choice. The Apostle Paul wrote two-thirds of the New Testament. By the way, I want you to hold up your note sheet. Or hold up. Now, I keep my Bible on my cell phone. I have it on my iPad. I have it on my computer. I have a leather and paper bound Bible as well. I have uh, the Bibles everywhere. I love having it with me on my phone because I have it at all times. If you have a downloaded U version 
onto your uh, phone, you should do that because you have access to so many Bibles, all the commentaries, and everybody knows you don't go nowhere without your phone, right? Guess what? You carry the Word of God with you at all times. I like you to hold up your Bibles. I like you to say, or, or hold up your, your, your wherever you have it. You can hold up the note sheet. It's full of the Word of God. And I want you to say this with me. Go ahead and put it on the screen, guys, because I want to be able to say it. Everybody say, this is my Bible. The owner's manual for my life. Written by God. Who invented it? If I do what it says, I will be significant, successful, and happy. But if I don't, I won't. So I will. By grace, through faith, in Jesus. Now that declaration that we do every single Sunday morning that before I preach, we always do that declaration. What it says to you is it says, you have a choice. You have the power of choice. God has given you the power of choice. And you're saying, if I choose to follow God's word, if I choose to follow God's plan, I will be significant. I will be successful. I will be happy. But if I don't, I won't. So I will. I will follow his plan. The power of choice can change your destiny. But uh, the, the Apostle Paul, who wrote two-thirds of the New Testament that we read, some of it we're reading right now, there was a time in his life when he was standing on trial for his life. They were, he was standing in front of King Agrippa. And King Agrippa had the authority to end his life or to choose not to end his life. And as he was standing in front of King Agrippa, knowing that he had the, that the power of life and death was in this king's hand for his physical life, Paul apparently must have been seemingly a very happy guy, even at that moment in his life, when all the things looked bad around him. Because he wrote this scripture uh, after the king questioned him for a little bit. And notice there's something different about this guy. And Paul said these words, and I want them to put it on the screen. You see this? Acts 26 2. This is what Paul said in the midst of his trial. Everybody say, in the midst of his trial. He said, I think myself happy. That's the kind of power God has given to you. Paul was on trial for his life in front of the king, Agrippa, and, 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 and apparently he seemed to be the happiest person in jail. So when the king actually inquired about his circumstances, instead of crying and complaining and talking about how hard and how unjust life was and how long he'd been waiting in jail, Paul said to King Agrippa, King Agrippa, the reason you're noticing my attitude is because I know how to think myself happy. There's something different inside of me, but it's not me. It's because I serve a king of kings and a lord of lords. And the king is like, what? So then Paul begins to give his entire testimony and tell him how he had been a living a life that was opposed to God. As a matter of fact, he was so opposed to God, he was out killing people that were of God. He was killing the Christians. He was chasing them down and persecuting them. And the king's listening to this story, and he's so amazed by them, by his story. And then Paul says, and then one God day, God stopped me in the tracks, stopped me in my tracks of killing these people, and stopped me, and came, and talked to me, shone a light upon me. I fell on my horse. I just saw the light. I saw the light. That's why we sing this thing, I saw the light, or that's why we have to say, he saw the light. I saw the light. It's because of what Paul had happened to him. That's why we say that to this very day. And even though Paul was facing a criminal death, he said, I have an eternal perspective, Mr. King. I have an eternal perspective. If God be for me, who can be against me? And that king looked at him, knowing that he had the power to choose, but his happiness, his joy, his attitude was so contagious, the king looked at him and said, Paul, almost thou persuadest me to be a Christian. And that would have ended that king's reign had he done so. Instead of looking at the circumstances of your lack, instead of looking at the circumstances, you need to tame your dragon of choice to look at everything that God has blessed you with. Choose to look at your salvation. How your life was before God. How good that God has been to you. If we tame the dragons of choice, when we look at, we, we will look at what God's Word said about us. 
When we, when we choose to start thinking about whatsoever things are lovely, whatsoever things are pure, whatsoever things be of a good report, those are words of Paul's, by the way, then it changes our perspective. King David went through a situation where he had just suffered a terrible catastrophe, and in this terrible catastrophe, men had come and stolen his and all of his men's wives and children and took them off into slavery. And they took them away. And they didn't have GPS. They didn't have cell phones and GPS. They couldn't just find a look at them. They had to follow, track them down, go chase them down. He didn't have that many men, but they went after these guys. And his own guys were so mad at him, they wanted to kill him. All right. They're like, you're the leader. It's your fault. Buck stops there, boy. And Paul said, you're right, you're right. And he went to God. And you know what he said he had to do? He said, I had to encourage myself in the Lord. I had to encourage myself in the Lord because everybody else wanted to kill him, including his friends and his people. And then he made a right choice. He made the choice to tame his in dragging by encouraging himself. And God turned everything around. David got all the stuff back that the enemy had stolen away from him. But the turnaround actually took place when David made a conscientious decision to choose encouragement instead of discouragement. Are you listening to me this morning? Yep. You hear what I'm saying about this? The Apostle Paul won several of his court uh, hearings, but eventually he lost the last one and Nero at his head chopped off. Now you may be thinking, wow, that's terrible. But guess what? Paul went out happy. Paul went out happy. You know what he said? He wrote what he said and he penned in his letters that you can read out in the last letters that was going out before his head was going to be taken off of his shoulders. He said, to live is Christ, to die is gain. How do you, how, how, how do you beat a guy like that? How do, you, how do you beat somebody who says, let me tell you something, I have an eternal perspective on life. You can take your best shot, Mr. Devil, but I'm going to tell you, I read the back of the book, I win. When it's all done, when the smoke clears, I'm the one that's going to still be standing through the ages of eternity, long after you, Mr. Devil, will be put in the kettle lake of fire. You have to have an eternal perspective. You have to understand what delivers Christ to die's game. You can't, you can't even discourage, discourage a person like that when you kill him. I put my life on the line. I'm not saying this to brag. I'm just saying, factually, because of the travels that I've done, the places that I've been, I put my life on the line for the gospel's sake many times in foreign countries. I've faced Al-Qaeda. I've had them threaten to kill me. I have faced gangsters. I have faced mobsters. I've had the communist uh, police, or the secret police chase me. Next weekend, my friend, Juan Carlos, uh, one of the guys that I helped rescue bring out of Cuba because they were trying to kill him. He's a pastor down there. He's going to be on this stage, and he's going to be ministering to you, and he's going to be telling some stories. I'm excited about him being here. Don't miss next week. You're going to hear from a man from Cuba who is full of the power of God and one of my best buddies for many, many years. But I'm just saying this to let you know, I know many times I had to say, you know what? If they take my life, if that's the best they can do, I have won. Because if I give up my life for the cause of Christ and it didn't make me less sad, it made me more happy than ever to know that today I'm going to give up my life for the cause of Christ, but I'll be standing before Jesus and I know God's got it. I know God's got everything. And he'll work everything out for the good. Because he made that promise. And that's a choice you make. See, that's a choice you make. You either say, oh me, or amen. You can't even discourage somebody. This weekend is Independence Day. We celebrated the 4th of July two days ago. But this entire weekend is all about the Declaration of Independence. And I'm not going to read it to you. But I think you should read it. I think you should look up and read the Declaration of Independence. And that Declaration of Independence, when those men declared it, it caused a war. Sometimes when you take a stand for God, it causes a war. That's a good place for you to shout amen. amen. Sometimes you get in trouble for doing the right thing. See, sometimes you get persecuted for doing the right thing. See, you don't always just have consequences for the bad things you do. Sometimes there are consequences for the good things that you do. But let me tell you what, in the long run, it makes a difference. And those men stood up, and yes, it cost everyone. Those signers of the Declaration of the Independence, most of them lost everything that they had and even their lives. And many of them were very wealthy men uh, who, who did that, but most of them lost everything that they had 
but that were willing to fight and that were willing to stand up for justice and freedom and for a place that God had established called America. America has committed sins. There's no doubt about it. Thank God that it's in a that it's been in a growth process for many years, just like as a little child. But when they first started, they said, "Here's what we're all about. We hold these truths to be self-evident that we have been created endowed by our Creator with certain inalienable rights." There is a difference between knowing what your standard is. We know what our standard is. Our standard is the Word of God. My standard is God's Word. I may miss it sometimes. I may fail sometimes. I may have to repent over my sins sometimes. But I have a standard that stands holy and righteous and justice. And it's God and God's Word and God's plan for my life. Amen. Amen. Patrick Henry was one of the founding fathers. And he kind of did the same thing that Paul did. He was a Christian, by the way. And they were, because he chose liberty, they put him, the British caught him, and they put him up on the gallows, and he's one of the signers of the decoration. And they put him up on the British gallows to hang him and put a noose around his neck. And they said, do you have any last words? And he said, yes. Give me liberty or give me death. Those, ring, those words ring out clear and they ring out strong today. Sometimes it's worth, some things are worth dying for. Some things are worth fighting for. Some things are worth taking a stand for. And Patrick Henry did that. I would like us all at this point to stand and give an applause to all of our servicemen who are not only currently serving, but all of our heroes who have died on the battlefield for their country. All the servicemen to stay standing while the rest of us sit down. All of you who have served in your country and served your country, let me tell you something. We honor you. We thank you. We appreciate you. We just want you to know that you have our greatest admiration and respect. Thank you so much. Let's give you a May we, in God's name, never take the sacrifice of our soldiers and our heroes and our veterans in vain. May we as a country and as a people of God always make the right choices to keep America free for the things that our men have so bravely fought and died for. God bless America. I encourage you all to go this week and see the movie America if you've not seen it. It's a documentary. It's a very interesting. It will show you some things that you may not understand what's going on and what's been going on in the country. Uh, and, and I think it's a very revealing movie. And I, 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 I would encourage you all to go see that movie. I took Sally on our date night. Normally we go see something romantic or action or something like that. But we decided to go see this movie and I'm so glad we did. And I encourage you to do the same thing. The truth is that your life will become whatever the sum total of your choices are. Now I want you to look at this next point. My life, and fill this in, my life plus right choices equals success and happiness. I have a choice in life because guess what, folks? Life is choice driven. Everybody say that with me. Life is choice driven. Now say it this way. My life is choice driven. That's why we have to tame the dragons of choice in our life. What is the definition of success? It, it, it depends on your worldview. If you have a pure, purely materialistic worldview, uh, then your, my definition of success would be he who, who has the most toys uh, wins. You know? He who dies with the most toys wins. You've seen that bumper sticker. But I have a biblical worldview. If I have peace and purpose in Christ, I'm physically, emotionally, and spiritually fulfilled. If I truly love God, and others, and they love me back, then I'm happy and I'm successful. When you have a biblical worldview, a Christian perspective, a godly outlook, then you know when it comes to happiness, the world can't give it. And guess what? The world can't take it away. However, the dragons of wrong choices can steal unhappy your, your happiness. In other words, if we reverse the equation that I put on there before, here's what it will be. My life Plus, wrong choices equals 
failure, and unhappiness. That's why choices are so important. That's why we have to take the gravity of choice. I want you to look at the Scripture here for me, with me, in your Scripture note sheet. Deuteronomy 30, 20. I want you to see what God says. Here's what God says about choices. I have set before you life and death, blessing and curses. Now, choose. If I say choose, choose. circle that word. Just circle that word, choose. Now, choose life so that you and your children may live, so you may love the Lord your God. Listen to His voice. Hold fast to Him. For the Lord is your life. I love the test that God gives us in life. Uh, not because I've passed them on. Uh, not because they didn't hurt. But I really love the fact that God always gives us open book tests. I mean, you know, it's when you went to school. If you had the open book test and you didn't know what the answer was, you could look through the book and you could find the answers. Guess what? There is no test that you go through in life that you don't get from God the ability to have the open book test. Because if you don't know what you're doing, if you don't know what the problem is, if you don't know what the answer to your problem is, then you go to God's Word. I don't care if it's on your cell phone, if it's on your iPad, it's on your computer, or if you have leather brown, or if you have a scroll like Jesus had. You look it up because the answer to your problem is in that Word. It's an open book test. Everybody say, I'm going through a test. It's just a test. It's just a test. And God has the answer. Alright, I want you to understand this. Now, I want you to see how God actually started this conversation about choosing life. He started it by this. Look at Deuteronomy 30, 11. Now, what I'm commanding you, because a lot of you say, man, hey, Pastor, it's so hard, though. You don't understand. Now, look at what God says. How many of you believe that God, God if, if God says it, I believe in that settles it. Yeah. How many believe God, what God says is true? It's true. Alright, if you believe that, look at what God says in Deuteronomy 30. Now what I'm commanding you today is not too difficult for you or beyond your reach. It's not up in heaven, nor is it beyond the sea. No, the word is very near you. It's in your mouth and in your heart so you may obey it. Now I want you to circle, not too difficult. Circle that in the scripture there. Not too difficult. See, because God's saying, this isn't beyond your reach. You're saying, man, it's beyond my reach. God says, it's not beyond your reach. God says, you can do this. And you need to say, I can do this. Everybody say, I can do this. I can tame the dragon of choices in my life. And then God gives us a promise to go with that. And look at this next uh, portion of Scripture, Deuteronomy 30, 11. For I command you today to love the Lord your God, Walk in obedience to Him. Keep His commandments, decrees, and laws. Then you will live and increase, and the Lord God will bless you in the land where you are entering to possess. God gave me the power of choice because He wanted me to be a child of God, not a slave of God. When God created us, He didn't want to create slaves. He didn't want to create robots. He wanted to create people who could choose to love Him or not to love Him. Because the only way you really get love you know, is to give love. And the only way a person can really give you love is they have the choice to love you or not. They have the choice. So you have a choice to love others. You have a choice to love yourself. Did you know the Bible teaches that you should love yourself? Love your neighbor as you love yourself. He said, man, I'm having a hard time loving myself, Pastor, because, man, I know me. I know what I've done. I know what I'm capable of doing. Well, let me tell you something. You have a choice to tame that dragon. You have a choice to tame those dragons. You don't have to be controlled by those negative emotions, by those bad behaviors. You don't have to be. You have the power of choices. Many people are unhappy because they feel like, man, life has mistreated them. They would, have, they would not have chosen the things that have happened in their life. They, they would not have chosen to have such things happen to, to, to them. But the truth is, my life is exactly what I chose for myself. It's exactly what I choose. Now, you don't choose who you're born to. You know, Pastor Sally's uh, 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 parents, uh, she, she had, I have very great parents. Pastor Sally knows what it is to have parents who really, they're not there for you. They don't care. You know, her father was an alcoholic, abusive uh, man. Uh, and and uh, she was abandoned by both her father and her mother. She knows what that's like, and that's not a choice that you get. But later on, she realized, I have a choice about how to react to the bad things that have happened to me in my life. 
And at the age of 31, she chose to let God be in charge of her life. You know, it took her a while. She can do a little stuff. <laughs> she, 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 she knows I'm playing with her. But she chose to not let the circumstances of the bad things that happened to her overcome her and overtake her. And that's the choice that we have born. Some people say, Jerry, that's easy for you to say. Uh, so you were born in America, or uh, you had two good parents who didn't get divorced, or you're born a certain color, or you have certain talents, or you were born extremely good looking. I can't help that. <laughs> but anyway, see, there's some things you can't help. Uh, but, but I want you to look at Proverbs 23, 7. It says this, As a man thinketh in his heart, so is he. Do you know who the first female millionaire in America was? The first female millionaire in America. In the late 80s, there was a woman. Oh, yeah, I should say 1880s. Yeah, I made a big late 1980s. No, in the 1880s, there was a woman who was born with nothing, had nothing. And this woman rose up from the most extreme abject poverty and became the first Oprah Winfrey. Her name was Madam C.J. Walker. She invented a line of products and sold them door to door until she had massive amounts of people that were doing the same thing at a factory built for her. Madam C.J. Walker was a black woman. The first female millionaire in America was a black woman. Let me tell you something. God on your side, and she did. There is nothing that's impossible for you. When you make the choices and you say, I'm not going to let nothing hold me back. I'm not going to let uh, skin color, uh, the place that I came from, what people say about me, my lack of education, because we'll do that, won't we? We'll do that. We'll have a tendency to do that. I don't know about you, but my mind can go cray cray sometimes. Is it just me? Is it just me? There are four sources of thought that we have. Uh, and I want you to write something down in these categories. I've listed four thoughts categories there for you. And what I'd like you to do is, is, is I would just like you to write some of your thoughts under each category now, now, as, as you think of something. And let me talk about these four thoughts and categories before we close. Number one, I have the thoughts that come from God. What are the sources of the thought? How, how many, like I said, we can have some great, great things run through our mind. Yeah. What are the source of the thoughts that we have in our mind? Number one, we have thoughts that come from God. And God thoughts, now let me explain God thoughts to you. It's real easy to identify God thoughts. You know how? They will be love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. Nine things you'll find if your thoughts are love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, Faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control, those will be of God. You know what those are called in the Bible? And Paul wrote them, as God told him to write them down. Those are called the fruits of the Spirit. Fruit is what comes off the end. If you have beautiful fruit coming off of the end of a tree, how many of you know you've got a good, healthy tree? All the way down, roots all the way up. If it's putting off nice peaches, man, you got a good peach tree there, it's a healthy tree. If it's putting off bad fruit, dead fruit, old fruit, it's not so healthy, is it? But the fruits of the Spirit are love, joy, and peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. And guess what? When you have those kind of thoughts running through your mind, that's God. You know that's God. And then I have thoughts that are planted by the devil. Yes, there is a devil. Pastor Jerry, you believe that? Yep, yeah, there, the, there is a devil. There is a Satan. Jesus said this about Satan. He's a thief who wants to kill, steal, and destroy from your life. When you see killing, stealing, and destroying, guess what? It's not God. It's the enemy. Sometimes we have a tendency, if you'll notice in the news media or a lot of people say, their theory is God does it all. He's the killer. He's the stealer. He's the destroyer. If it's good, it's God. If it's bad, it's God. That's not true. God clearly identifies 
what His plan is for us, and He clearly identifies what you know, the things that He wants to do for us. And especially after Jesus Christ came, when Jesus Christ took all the sins for us upon Himself, then we are free from all that bondage and free from all that mess. And so the thoughts that come to us now, when you become a believer in Christ, and those thoughts are coming to you, those are not thoughts, those are from the devil. And it's easy to it's easy to identify them. I call them mind monsters. Everybody say mind monsters. Mind monsters. That's those cray cray thoughts you have. You say, how do I identify them? Very simple. They will be the opposite of love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. Right? Satan is the opposite of God. So if you have unloving thoughts, who's that coming from? If you have unjoyful thoughts, non-peaceful thoughts, non-patient thoughts, everybody's like, oh my God, he really messing with me right now. Unkind thoughts, not good thoughts, not unfaithful thoughts. Not non-gentle thoughts. Love, joy, peace. Patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness. Out of control thoughts. You ever get like out of control? I just, I'm out of control. <laughs> if those thoughts are coming through your mind, they're out of control. They're not from God. I must say, they ain't from God. So we've identified that. And then you have thoughts that are planted by others. You have thoughts that are planted by others. If you're listening to a wise pastor or a believer who is counseling you according to God's word, let me tell you what, there's some pastors that counsel people not according to God's word. I mean, I hate to say that as a pastor, but it's just the truth. If you have a pastor that is counseling you according to the Word of God or another friend who is a Christian and they're counseling you according to the Word of God, then those are... that, And that, that's a great help. But if you're listening to people whose idea of great advice comes from Honey Boo Boo or basketball lives, I mean, if you're listening to the people who's, who are counseling you according to that kind of thought pattern, then you need to shut that down. That's the wrong sir. Don't be calling them. Oh, girl, you won't believe what happened to me. Because she just feed you right in your jaw. Oh, you need them. <laughs> and then somebody going to end up in jail. <laughs> Am I right? See, y'all be quiet because you don't right. <laughs> then we have thoughts of our own. The Bible says that... Uh, that we can have thoughts, mind monsters of our own that we bring. Jesus said this, some of you are drawn away or you know, pulled away from God by your own lust and enticement. Even the devil didn't make you do it. He was like, I will do this. Hello? So in the, there was a famous comedian in the 60s. I loved him. His name was Flip Wilson. He used to, he used to say, uh, every time something, he did something bad, he said, oh, the devil made me do it. <laughs> you know? It ain't always the devil. Sometimes it's the devil in us. You know what I'm saying? Now, we're letting the devil use us, but we do have these choices. And, and they can be bad thoughts. They can be mind monsters. But you know what else they can be? They can be those thoughts that you're saying to yourself where you're saying, I'll never be anything. I'll never be nothing. I'm a failure. I can't get ahead in life. I, 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 don't have an, I don't have the right education. I don't know the right people. Those are mind monsters. And those are your own thoughts too. They're negative. They're not the thoughts that God wants you to have about yourself. God wants you to say, I am the righteousness of God in Christ. Greater is He that's in me than he that's in the world. God wants you to have the joy of the Lord and say, the joy of the Lord is my strength. He wants you to be quoting His Word and repeating what God says. Say what God says about you because God doesn't say, you're a dirty, rotten dog. You're no good. God says, I love you so much. I sent my own son to pay for your sins with His blood. And you are precious because the, the price of a thing, the value of a thing is in the price 
that somebody will pay. God valued you so much that He gave His only begotten Son. That's how much you're worth to God. Stop putting yourself down. Stop saying you're valueless. Stop saying that and start saying who God says you are. Amen. That's what lifts you up. That's what causes you to tame those dragons. The movie How to Tame Your Dragon uh, 2 has a sequel, and, and, and I'm going to preach that, not this next week, but I'm going to preach it after that. I think Pastor Sally is going to, we'll see, we'll work it out. But uh, uh, I'm going to preach part two of this message uh, in a week or two. And uh, how many of you learned something today? Did you learn something from that today? Did it help strengthen you? Did it help put you in the right direction? Well, that's why we preach the Word of God. That's what church is all about. You can choose to have God's plan, or you can choose to have the enemy's plan. You made a God choice when you came to this church this morning. Some of you are like, well, I just picked it. I went by, I saw the sign, I like this, and no perfect people allowed, that's me. And, or, or this. Let me tell you something. I want you to know something. You're not here by an accident. You're not